Well, it's National Bird Week in Australia, you noticed, of course. The science show on RN is immensely fond of birds. That's why today I'm in northern New South Wales at Rocky Creek Dam on the side of a hill near the woods with Tim Lowe, whose new book explains how songbirds began here in Australia and why we also have such aggressive bird life. But Tim, your book isn't just about birds, it's about us, isn't it? No, there's a lot about the bird-human relationship, which is something I think is really interesting. Because we have the world's most aggressive birds, the aggressive encounters between people and birds in Australia are really strong. So magpies and people, noisy miners moving into our gardens and being annoying by frightening away other birds. And then the fact that we've got cassowaries in North Queensland, which are the world's most dangerous birds, the second heaviest birds there are. But not only that, they are realistically urban birds in parts of North Queensland. Huge numbers of people have houses backing onto rainforest and some of them deliberately don't build fences because they want these giant birds wandering through their gardens. I mean, it's quite an extraordinary situation. Why are our birds so uniformly aggressive, do you think? I think one issue going on is that there's just so much nectar in the Australian landscape and if you think about the kinds of foods birds have, if you're a seed-eating bird or an insect-eating bird, once you eat those foods they're gone. With nectar, the flowers will produce nectar day after day, week after week. If you have a eucalypt in flower, flowering grevillea shrub, the food's just sitting there. You don't need any skill to find a flowering tree or shrub in Australia. The skill you need is to be able to fend off the other birds that might want it. So nectar selects for birds that are aggressive. We have huge amounts of nectar, therefore we've evolved very large nectar birds. So the fighting is on an extraordinary scale and the really aggressive birds like noisy miners, they turn their aggression on everything they can, you know, including people, cows, snakes, lizards, fruit bats and so that's one reason for amazing aggression but there's another which is that we are the original home of the songbirds and we've had songbirds in Australia longer than anywhere else. They've evolved in all these different directions and some of them are very large and large songbirds tend to be very smart and aggression works really well for magpies and to a lesser extent also for butcher birds and currawong. So it's, it's a little bit complicated but it's an amazing story. What is the evidence for this claim of yours, the basis for the book, that the songbirds evolved here? Because I remember having an argument with David Attenborough saying, all your birds squawk because they're so brilliant looking and they don't need to advertise in any other way. Whereas most of our birds in the Northern Hemisphere are dowdy little brown things and they, they need to be singing like nightingales, otherwise you wouldn't take any notice. Well, I mean, one reason why they need to be singing is that you have those really harsh winters and then the pair of birds is trying to re-establish the territory in spring so they can time breeding for the peak of insects in summer so thence you get that crazy frenzy of spring singing here you, the birds don't need to do that because it's a much more even climate we have evergreen trees therefore insects are available year round therefore you, you don't need that highly intense bout of singing but to get back to your question there's three three levels of evidence which is every kind of evidence there is so it was genetic research that really nailed it and there's been any number of genetic studies which show that if you create a DNA tree of songbirds it's the lyrebirds and scrub birds branch off first then tree creepers bower birds then this group with honey eaters and thornbills all our, all our little dicky birds and that this branching pattern is indicating that these are the oldest lineages of songbirds. Now, some people don't get totally blown away with genetics. They find that a bit pointy-headed. So you've got fossil evidence. We know that if you go to Riversley, our famous fossil site in northwest Queensland, there were lyrebirds scratching around in the rainforest there in the mid-Miocene. Now, if you go to similar aged fossil strata in Europe, they have a fantastic fossil bird record. All the songbirds they have there are in completely non-existent families. These are old lineages that died out. You go to Africa, very rich songbird fossil sites in uh, Namibia, Kenya, no songbirds at ever. So the oldest identifiable songbird fossils come from Australia. And then anatomically, lyrebirds, they've got fewer, this sounds really weird to say it, but fewer throat muscles than all other songbirds, even though they are the best songsters. All these anatomical oddities indicating that they're a very early branch. Tree creepers also have anatomical oddities. And then you get this uniformity in other songbirds. So everything lines up. This is not controversial it's accepted by scientists all over the world and in fact yes indeed i've had a chat with david attenborough since quoting your 
book, actually, and he does agree, which is very nice. As you probably know, he's terribly fond of the birds of paradise in Papua New Guinea. Yes, and I mean, they're a perfect example of how, because we've had songbirds the longest, they've had time to go in all these weird and wonderful directions, and wow... Isn't that a wonderful direction? It certainly is. Do you think we're appreciative of our birds sufficiently in Australia? Well, I think we all quietly like them very much, but there hasn't been sufficient recognition of how spectacular they are. So there is still a bit of cultural cringe going on. Even though most bird watchers have been exposed to the evidence that we were the home of the songbirds, it hasn't been properly digested and it doesn't get talked about much. And it was certainly a reason why I wrote the book. I'm thinking, hey, don't you get this, what it really means? Yeah. And what about bird populations? You, you say, of course, that we see them in, oh, there goes... Sulphur-crested cockatoo. Sulphur-crested cockatoo. I couldn't quite see the cresting bit, but uh, normally in larger numbers of crowds flying past, but... Uh, in the forest surrounding us here in northern New South Wales. We see lots and lots of birds, and we assume from that that the populations are fine. Are they? Well, it's a real story of winners and losers, and we have vast numbers of birds that are fading away, so particularly inland woodland birds are doing badly. All sorts of examples, swift parrot, orange-bellied parrot, but we also have winners, and sulphur-crested cockatoos are a really good example of that, that you have them in the inner suburbs of Sydney. No matter where you are in Australia, you can have these big, colourful parrots, big, smart songbirds, and so I think for a lot of Australians, you're thinking, what biodiversity crisis? Look at all these birds in my garden and what they're not appreciating is that you've got this one subset that are doing well and a very large number that are doing badly and that I think that's an unfortunate thing that for people who don't really look into the situation you get a sort of superficial impression that's quite misleading. And what about the study? Uh, One of the most startling things about your book is learning how the scientists in the old days used to look at them and note their characteristics then kill them and some of them exporting them uh, the most startling of all is the packed cages of well galahs or budgery gars you know where you had 50 dead ones fall out of the case as they got to the other end i mean there wasn't anything terribly sentimental about the old days was there no that's right so they didn't have good binoculars for quite a while off i mean often they couldn't identify a bird without shooting it But you can't use that as an excuse because they were still shooting birds that were easy to identify. You know, it's quite clear from um, reading their descriptions. But, I mean, it's amazing to read John Gould in the 19th century. He writes in this this book he wrote in 1865 that, barely do I see a crimson chat and I bang, the dead bird's in my hand. You can barely imagine the joy of having it. And you think, you know, nowadays we think, oh, this, you know, how could you feel such joy (laughs) having killed this beautiful bird? But, yeah, it's totally different values back then. It, It took a very long time for those values to change. If you look at the history of what we now call BirdLife Australia, it was a huge battle within the organisation to get rid of that shooting and it was really only when bird photography became inexpensive and accessible that those people with that really strong collecting instinct had a non-lethal way to collect. You could collect a photo rather than a, a dead bird or an egg. I'm going to shock you now. I actually do feed birds. You've got a section in your book on bird feeding and uh, I take my legitimization from Daryl Jones from Griffith University who actually did an Occam's Razor talk on why it's not a bad thing. Oh there's a plover. Is that plover landing? Yes, no, I, I suspect they've got a nest around here somewhere the way they're taking an <laughs> awful lot of interest in it. Yes us. indeed, but um, the wonderful thing, instead of killing birds, I actually watch their behaviour and their behaviour is extraordinary. Not simply the intelligent ones such as the magpies who are grateful for the little bits of meat I provide them and line up the family of four to sing me a song. You know, they double track and they do descants and so on. And they never attack, by the way. (laughs) But my lot actually do get along very well, both the parrots, the seed eaters and the corvids. The thing that astounded me also in your book is how you describe them eating seeds to get supplies of water and not needing liquid water, some of the different species, for weeks on end. Zebra finches and budgerigars. That's right, in captivity, these two birds can survive without water. We don't know if they can do it for long periods in the wild. It is truly remarkable that they could 
be so well adapted that is so far outside that anything we could comprehend you know stick someone in a room with a plate full of seed and say that's it and <laughs> get your water from yeah, that yeah. well when it comes to understanding the birds being able to watch them and see the sorts of behavior you get when they're used to your garden they're used to your precinct you can't actually spend so much time if you're an ordinary person in the forest you know with your binoculars and that's as close as you get do you think we've got a lot to learn from watching animal behavior bird behavior oh yes i certainly think so what i really value is just the sense of an enlarged community so i mean we live in large cities but a lot of people are lonely uh, we want to know what's going around us but our time is limited and if you if you get to know the birds i think there's an expanded sense of community so watching them not only teaches you about nature but i think there's a larger sense of connection with your suburb with what's going on around you and i, I think that's a really positive thing I, I don't think there could be any doubt that people who have birds in their lives have more joy than people who have no access to birds at all and so i mean all nature's good but birds are just it's just so easy so welcoming and we're so privileged in australia we've got these big colorful smart birds right there in our gardens up on the verandas and yeah that's a wonderful thing they're not my children they're, they're my neighbors and friends couldn't agree more tim lowe's book is called where song began